Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the XBE Thrive series, sponsored by the Diversity Consortium. Today, we're going to talk about positioning for success with the Fortune 1000. Just a little bit of housekeeping as we're going through. Um, you're going to see somewhere on your screen, it might be at the top, might be on the side, but there's a bar with some tools there. Um, you're going to notice that there is an opportunity to chat with us. And so we're going to ask, this is interactive, we're going to ask you some questions. Uh, if you have any questions, um, at any time in the presentation, please feel free to type them in and we're going to either answer your question at that time uh, at the end of the deck or if uh, we get too many questions, we're not able to answer them, we'll get back to you uh, with an e email answer. So thank you so much for your time. We, we greatly appreciate you being here. Just very quickly about the Diversity Consortium, it's our mission to make a measurable difference in the supplier diversity landscape. And uh, we truly believe that. We, we are grateful that you're here with us and um, today, you're going to hear from one of the experts, uh, Mr. Randall Dobbins. Hello, Randall. Are you with us? Hello, Rob. How are you? I'm doing outstanding. How about yourself? So wonderful. I can't stand myself. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us. And um, just tell us very uh, briefly about Diversity Works. Uh, Diversity Works actually exists to educate small businesses on doing business with big businesses. We've been at this uh, since about 2004, and uh, we have a world-class curriculum that provides no less than six different sides of the corporate supply chain and what it really takes for what we call XBEs to not only get in, uh, but to, to win this game called corporate contracting. Outstanding, thank you. And, and uh, good thing you reminded me, we're gonna use the term XBE today um, interchangeable with disadvantaged or diverse businesses of all kinds. Um, you know, all too often you hear of MBE and DBE, and but none of those acronyms are all inclusive. So we use XBE to make sure that we include everybody. That's veterans, it's LBGTQ, it is uh, abled and disabled, it is woman owned, it is minority owned, um, you name it. So all together, it's going to be called XBE, and this is the XBE Thrive. And we're going to start off today with, with a question for you. And we'd just like to understand how well you think you are positioned right now today to win work from a Fortune 1000. So if you can go ahead and use that chat feature, go ahead and enter this in. Um, while this is happening, you know, while you're entering the in, uh, the answers, we're going to continue to collect them. We've got a producer behind the scenes. His name is Adam. Hello, Adam. And uh, Adam is going to be collecting this stuff for us. So um, we'll get back to the answers uh, at the Q&A session at the very end of this conversation. So with that, let's talk about what we're going to talk about. So uh, Randall, tell us uh, what's on the agenda for today. All right. Thanks, Rob. And uh, Adam, thank you. Uh, and welcome, everyone. So on the agenda is um, let's talk about uh, what's going on with XBE's potential to do business with the Fortune 1000, viewing it from the perspective of what corporations say. And let's talk about, you know, how you drive value. And in this case, value being defined by your ability to, to really and truly help a corporate client given their current climate. And then let's kind of, uh, draw the curtain back a little bit to actually talk about what really goes on in a corporation. How do they make purchasing decisions? So we're going to talk about the, the actual supply chain, and then we're going to get into the actual three determinants on your ability to succeed in this market. Your selling proposition, uh, whether you're selling a product or a solution, and your ability to handle a contract. So that's what we have, Rob. Awesome. Well, let's get right to it. So what what is the perception from the corporate point of view? Great question, Rob. Essentially, there are three reasons why most companies fail in this market. Uh, they have better than a 90% fail rate. So I want you to think about this. Of every 10 companies that approach a Fortune 1000, nine of them are going to fail, not because there's only one winner, okay? Uh, because oftentimes a number of commodities, a number of areas under under review or under purchase have multiple suppliers. The, you, you know, it's, it, it isn't that they're limited to one contract. They may need multiple players to play. The issue with XBEs 
out of uh, 10 XBEs that are going nine fail, and they fail not because the corporations don't want to do business with them. They fail primarily for one of the three following reasons, if not uh, all three. Either the small business is not sufficiently familiar with what it is that uh, the company does, or corporate buyers will tell you the issue number two is that they don't really know the company's specific business. Uh, you, you know, how you would approach Costco is very different than how you promote, uh, approach General Motors or Exxon Mobil. Uh, or the buyer feels like the, uh, the supplier couldn't really handle the opportunity. And that comes from back in the day when people took a chance on small businesses or, or XBEs and uh, they just weren't ready. You, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to give a million dollar contract to a company with $100,000 in annual revenue. Yeah, no, I, I could see that happening, but th that sounds like it happens to other people, but not necessarily to me, right? Why is this happening to me? Yeah, and, and that's when we get it, you know, when you start looking at the three issues we just laid out, you, you know, once again, corporate buyers believe you, you, you know, you you don't necessarily know their their industry. You don't necessarily know their business and you might not be ready for the kind of contracts they want to award. Then this boils down to a skills matter type of scenario. It's what do you really know about what it takes to succeed in this market? Once you know what it takes to succeed in this market, you now can address those big three concerns. Oh, that's that's perfect. It makes perfect sense to me right now. Um, so what's happening in the, in the climate today? So, <clears throat> you know, we talked about, uh, especially in the agenda, when you start looking at uh, what, what's going on in the buyer's world, what do you know about their business, what's going on? We see uh, across all of the trade journals and financial journals and in press releases, and even when you talk to some of your friends and neighbors and uh, fellow churchgoers and folks that you see in the in the streets, they'll tell you what's going on with their companies. And there's this whole big activity of ESG. It's all encompassing environmental, social governance, and it speaks to a lot of things. It it speaks to climate change. It speaks to um, inclusion, diversity, and equity. It speaks to uh, governance, how you actually have your business structured to deal with all of these kinds of things. It's a pretty pervasive thing. And so it even hits the supply chain with regard to who are companies doing business with and um, are, are they doing business with companies that support their ESG objectives or their social justice objectives or their diversity and inclusion or inclusion and diversity and equity objectives. And then clearly, when we step back and we look at some of the hacking and uh, phishing attempts and everything else that's going on, cyber is huge with a lot of the customers. And so they want to make sure if you're a corporate buyer that any transaction that you engage in with a supplier does not put your business at risk. Uh, or specifically the confidential information that you may share with one another. Obviously, health, safety, and environmental is an issue. I mean, we're watching the whole thing with baby formula um, go, go on. That's a safety issue, whether or not product gets contaminated, uh, let alone any workplace issues or let alone any kind of hostile work environment issues or, or um, any other kinds of things that we see playing out. That continues to be a primary concern and it affects your potential Fortune 1000's profitability as well yours. And then uh, one of the big concerns, especially now that we're looking at uh, a lot of consolidation and a number of different things going on in the industry, what are the actual capabilities that companies actually have out in the marketplace? Big companies are having to reinvent themselves regularly, so they're looking for XBEs who can actually help them to identify what they haven't yet identified or help them get to where they want to be faster. And then of course, supply disruption. We all know from the pandemic, we all know 
uh, with the activities going on in Ukraine. We all know from a whole host of things that supply disruptions are very real. It's going to take some time to work through them, and everyone's looking to either avoid them or quickly get through them. So that's the current business climate. So when a when a when a when a when a corporate supplier says we need people to understand what what's important to us and what's going on you as an xbe understanding this allows you to talk about your business in a way that solves an immediate problem for your client that's why this matters yeah you're you're absolutely right and every one of those things is actually happening right now so uh i can see it so let's let's take this down a few uh a few hundred feet and tell me you know from a supply chain perspective right because i'm a supply chain guy H how how do i as a business you know begin to to navigate my way absolutely well first and foremost uh, the whole concept of supply chain management might be foreign to a number of people so i just want to take a couple of seconds and talk about uh what is supply chain management and why does it exist and basically supply chain management is uh, a formal process to understand how you actually procure inventory, manage and dispose of an item, any item that the company may use from the from an idea all the way to to what we call disposition, cradle to grave. And what supply chain does is it formalizes the methodology of how that item goes through the company. All right. Now, why why would somebody do that? Why is that important? If you do it right, it drives improved customer service, it drives improved revenues, and it drives improved profitability to the business. All right. In the old days, companies didn't spend much time on this because they did everything in house. But when they started engaging suppliers, they had to manage them. When you start having an activity move from one spot to the next spot to the next spot to the next spot sequentially, you created a chain of events. And so that's how we got there. And the bottom line is you should be able to deliver uh, ROI from supply chain initiatives. So when we start looking at the supply chain review, what I quickly want to differentiate between because it affects how you want to think about approaching your customer and demonstrating to them the value that your company can 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 provide to them which is why they should pick you over your competitor we're not going to go too deep in this we're just going to give you enough information so that you have some sense that this is important for me to understand in terms of how do i pitch my my, my product or service so what we look at right here in the uh, upper left hand corner supply chain versus purchasing versus procurement supply chain is end to end your business may not have um, everything going on end to end. You may only have a slice of it. Purchasing what we think about is uh, materials management, um, uh, materials management, uh, inv inventory systems, and the actual act of procurement. And then the, where it really affects you all is the notion of procurement, which is where the contract comes from. Now, you may have something to do with materials management because you're selling an inventory product so you will interact with the materials management group uh, and depending on how sophisticated an operation you have you may uh, get in, in um, you may interact with the actual inventory management or the systems things in terms of them sending flags to you on when to reorder and a whole host of other things so this is important in terms of understanding how they view the world and how they are figuring out who to who to buy from what the capabilities are and how that they can more effectively integrate them into their system now specifically in terms of driving rfps that's that's what we're, we're all here about right how, how do i get more business <laughs> let's uh go over here to direct spend versus indirect spend direct spend is what goes into the cost of goods sold indirect spend is everything else so i'll give you an example um if you are an automobile manufacturer tires that go onto the car that they're going to inventory and sell that's called direct spend if they happen to have a, a, a company-owned vehicles, um, uh, company-owned vehicles that they give to to various employees to drive around, if that 
uh, uh, employee needs to replace a tire on that company vehicle, that's indirect spend because it doesn't go into the cost of goods sold. Now, why that's important to you as an XBE is direct spend items are typically purchased well in advance. They uh, will be subjected to different types of procurement strategies. They're often extremely leveraged purchases and um, RFPs for those things can go out anywhere from three months to three years in advance so that the assembly line always runs or whatever the process is, whether it's a, uh, an assembly line or, or, or a chemical process or whatever. Whereas indirect spend, sometimes you have a good idea of what you are going to spend on indirect spend. Sometimes things just happen in the business and you deal with it. So that's what's going on here. I'm going to go all the way over to the other side because that goes part and, uh, part and parcel with direct spend versus indirect spend is planned spend. Once again, planned is I know these are uh, activities that I'm going to be purchasing. I've got a budget for this. I'm going to go from that. Unplanned spend means that these are things that just happen and I got to figure out what, what to do here. Uh, I'll give you an example of unplanned spend. Uh, unplanned indirect PPE, all right, for COVID. On the one hand, there was planned spend because if I have a health, safety, and environmental organization, if any of my re <clears throat> my employees require personal protective equipment, then I already know how many masks and gloves and um, uh, uh, fire retardant clothing and other things I need. But if you throw in something like a pandemic, something like a, a workplace incident or whatnot, I didn't plan on that, and that could create a huge opportunity of unplanned spin for me, all right? The other piece I want to talk about is commodity segmentation. It, you, you just heard me mention PPE. We have uh, commodities. PPE is in um, a health and safety or protective equipment commodity, all right? Tires would be in a commodity. Pumps would be a, an example of a commodity. Pipe and tubing would be examples of commodities. Bearings uh, would be an example of commodities. The, uh, chemicals, um, uh, processed chemicals, those are examples of commodities. So to understand everything that a company buys, buyers will often look at them in commodities or categories so they can figure out what everything has in common and how they might buy them from you. If you understand which commodity what you're selling is grouped in, then you have a really good idea of whether or not it's a direct spin, indirect spin, whether or not it's going to come at you planned or unplanned, whether or not there's a procurement implication or, uh, or a materials management or systems imp uh, implementation, and you have an idea of the types of strategies that a company would use to actually purchase from you. Hey, that's excellent. So, so now tell me about. Oh, there you go. You're going to tell me more about the uh, the procurement strategy and what I should be doing. Well, absolutely, because uh, this gets us a little bit more into what's actually going on. And and once again, I, I got some quick takeaways that I want you to 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 um, to get, get, get gather from this slide. But we get at the evolution of procurement. This is going to have an impact on. Uh, who you're engaging with and how they might choose to 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 interact with you. And when we talk about evolution of procurement, we talk about the old days of what we call three bids and a buy, which is somebody issues an RFP, they get a handful of suppliers and they pick the lowest or best value and they do that for everything versus uh, some people now that start looking at strategic alliances and strategic relationships and they figure out what portion of the business do they need to have more high touch uh, involvement with and how do they then begin to link those results to the actual performance of the business. And you can typically tell when you're interacting with a company how evolved they are. And now that CEOs are beginning to see that uh, every single penny that is saved in supply chain drops to the bottom line. They see now that this has about as much as increasing market share, selling new product, doing other kinds of things as a critical component of managing the business. So you can tell a lot about a company when you understand how evolved they are, and then that lets you know um, how you can approach them 
do you approach them just on a casual transactional basis or do you want to have a more in-depth involved relationship with them do you want to be as we would say more intimate with that customer and uh, you might trade profit for uh, for volume because that could be a good customer for you the next thing you want to look at <clears throat> is whether or not items are purchased at the home office or at a field or plant location as a procurement strategy uh, typically home office or head office purchases are aggregated across different locations and in general field and plant purchases are specific to that location it may be it may make more sense for you as an xbe to approach a field or plant location than necessarily going straight to head office in general, a lot of your supplier diversity professionals are at the head office location. They tend to support field and plant projects, but in some cases you actually have supplier diversity and uh, buying staff at the field and plant location. And depending on what you are putting into the market will determine which of these places are going to be a better opportunity for you. Uh, strategic versus tactical procurement. This gets at once again more formal exercises that uh, a buyer will go through how many resources the company gets at putting uh, at putting uh, putting these uh, initiatives into action. Um, how really and truly how aggressive they're going to negotiate this with you and what level of s services have they premised in the company's books that uh, they think they can drop to the bottom line. Whereas tactical procurement really and truly is about buying what's needed, being about as efficient at it as, as you can uh, at a reasonable cost and going on. So for you as an XBE, uh, if we go to the tire example, in some cases a tire might be a strategic procurement. In other cases, it might be a tactical procurement. You may have to price that differently. So the more astute and aware you are, you know, once again, we said this is a skills matter <laughs> business, right? The more you have a sense of uh, what what is going on with that purchase, the the better your pitch to to put it to be quite candid and frank about it. The better your pitch, the better you understand what's going on here. You um, always in this market are looking at a continuous improvement focus. Uh, whether you call it um, a value analysis, whether you call it uh, lean or six sigma whatever Kanban, whatever you want to call it, there's an expectation in the Fortune 1000 supply chain that there should be year over year savings. They're very open uh, as to how those savings uh, are uh, come about, but the the end result has to be once again increased value. So yes, it is possible that your price could go up, but the total cost of what you're selling in that company's value chain or in their entire system could actually come down. Now, I, I, I wanna park on that for just one minute. This is vitally important to you, our listener, because this is where one of your primary opportunities and key differentiators come in. This is why XBEs are vitally important in this process. We as XBEs bring about a different life experience. We have a different way of viewing the world. Um, a lot of times we've had to be scrappy to keep our businesses up and going, and we have innovative, exciting ways to get things done, and that drives corporate value. So when you really and truly start looking at how can you start driving continuous improvement for a customer, this is your key to success in this area right here. And I do want you to be aware, um, we, we do get a lot of pushback from people saying, um, yeah, I was competing against a big company and they, they just aren't, aren't serious about switching. And so what I want you to know here is historically, it isn't that they weren't serious about switching. It is that there's a cost to switching internally within their organization. It's about a 3% uh, switching cost hurdle. So, I mean, you, you can do the math on that. 
for uh, every one million dollars of spin, it's going to cost about thirty thousand dollars internally to switch from one vendor to the next. So if you're bid bidding on a million dollar uh, activity and you're only offering a thirty thousand dollar savings, that's not enough for them to switch. Your savings has to be well above that thirty thousand. I, I, I hate to be the one to tell you that, okay? <laughs> and you might say, well, Randall, I can't drop my prices 3%. That gets us back to what we talked about with this continuous improvement. Your bid might only have 3% price improvement. Uh, it may actually have a 3% price increase, but the way you describe how you actually drive value, uh, you may actually be able to show a 5 or 7 or 8% savings. So, I do need you to be aware that you, it's it's not so much like the government where they just take the lowest price. We're talking about best value in this activity. You're you're absolutely right. And boy, do you got a lot of experience in this. I would love if you can just boil this down to a handful of things that let me learn from your experience. Where what what are the some of the tricks that I really need to have in my pocket? I I know I, I can't ask for the world in an hour. But boy, if you can just lead me a couple, two, three, point me in a good direction and get me started. Well, I, I told you we were just going to focus in on three simple things. <laughs> All right, so let's, great, great question, Rob. Let's just get straight to it. So here you go. You have about uh, three things that you, you need to address. How to establish a unique selling proposition, how to offer your products and services the way big companies want to buy them, and how to make sure your customer knows you can handle the contract not only today, uh, but tomorrow. And so under establishing your unique selling proposition, when someone meets you, when you start talking about an opportunity, you need to make sure that uh, number one, what you're talking about is relevant to their business and relevant to their current problem. All right. Um, you know, imagine if you were to go to Abbott, the people that made the baby formula right now, and you said you had a process to get ahead of contamination uh, so that you could remediate it without them having to shut down their, their manufacturing facility. <laughs> Would that be relevant? It absolutely would be. It solves a problem for them and it dramatically improves their situation. Quantified, show which specific benefit it delivers and express that benefit in numeric terms. One of the things in the process business, and I know Rob, you have examples about this, but when I was a buyer, people out in the field would often say they were uh, going with an existing supplier and they were letting things ride because the plant would lose $30,000 an hour if they had to take the, the unit down. Okay, so if you are selling something that allows them to maintain their uptime, if you're allowing something that uh, reduces the amount of time it takes for somebody to work on something, if you have productivity improvement, if somebody can get uh, the same amount of work done in a seven hour day than an eight hour day, uh, if 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 somebody can get more work done per hour, you, you know, whatever it is, you want to be able to quantify the value of what it is you do. And then under number three, unique differentiation, you need to be able to explain why they should get it from you rather than your customers, I mean, your competitors. So in this case, if what makes you unique is that you have a, pro a proprietary system, you have a patented system, um, you have a trademark system. Uh, you 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 may have um, under unique differentiation have a, a a proven process, or you have a dedicated workforce, or um, you you. I mean, there's just a whole host of different ways that you can differentiate your yourself from your customers. Maybe your customer process, uh, um, your 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 customer satisfaction process delivers a faster result for problem resolution. Whatever it is, you want to be able, you can clearly differentiate what you do from your competitors. Why should somebody buy from you? It's it's like, why should I buy from Costco versus Walmart? <laughs> okay. And you do know they have two different business models, right? <laughs> the second secret, how to offer products and services the way big companies want to buy them. Now, this one, 
this is probably the biggest challenge for a lot of us um and 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 i went through this one as well uh, i'll give you a quick story on this one uh i want you to picture this you you're you're going to you're going to buy a new car you've kind of figured out <clears throat> you, you know what make and model you bought what what color you want and uh, you already have a good idea of the options you want and you you know it's going to happen so you get to the to the to the uh to the lot and this eager salesperson starts heading over to you uh and and you know this time you're ready for it all right because you came in to buy right and and, and they say hey i'm glad you're here i want to sell you some tires and you go huh what this is the new car showroom right and you're, you're like why is this person trying to sell me tires when i'm here to buy a new car and as, as, as silly as that example sounds, that's exactly what corporate buyers deal with on a regular basis. They have a solution. They have gone through, because remember we talked about commodities, right? They have gone through, they've looked at groups of activity. They figure out how they all work together. What they've done is they've leveraged the spend of that entire string or chain or system of products to get them to act as one. If we take the car example, it used to be that on the assembly line, you take that entire everything on the dashboard, uh, an automobile manufacturer used to put everything in there one at a time. And then um, they start saying, well, hey, what if we start having our uh, our suppliers do different pieces? So now you have suppliers that came up with dashboards and suppliers that came in with um, uh, air conditioning systems and suppliers that came in with airbags. And now, all of that, that entire dashboard comes as one single unit and the robot just attaches it to the frame. Now you see how it has gone from a product to a solution. It went from just the needle on the gas gauge to an entire dashboard that just gets plugged right into the rest of the electronics and it goes through the assembly line and probably uh, 65, 70% time faster than it used to back in the day. And so if you aren't currently selling a solution, this might be the opportunity where you look and see who you can partner with and uh, figure out how you bring a solution to market or collectively you bring a solution to market. But what, what you wanna see on this so slide is how do you find out whether or not you're offering a product or a solution so quickly. Uh, when you're at a networking event you, or when you get a chance to talk to a buyer, whether it's uh, at the your kid's soccer match or wherever you may come across one, just ask them how do they currently buy what you sell? Is it purchased standalone or part of a group or bundle? Kind of like that dashboard. Uh, and then you can go ahead and ask them what do they like most about their current, provide, uh, their current provider? You can ask what features or benefits they value most. Uh, you can ask them, this is a great question, if they were to make a change, what would be the minimum cost or value savings they would need to internally justify the switch? Remember that 3% uh, switching cost. Then you can ask them if the product or service is a planned or unplanned purchase. Be, be prepared for them to say both, and then you want to find out under which conditions is it planned and under which conditions is it unplanned. Uh, and then you can ask them, how do they feel their current configuration compares or stacks up against their competitors? And then here's your, here's your question right here. This is the one that's going to win the RFP for you. Ask if the sky was the limit, what if anything would they do differently? Your answer for that one is going to tell you exactly how to write your RFP. <laughs> oh, and let's get, sorry about that, Rob, you about to say? No, no, I I was just chiming in saying, no doubt, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head about a corporate buyer and wh where they come from. Oh yeah, I, I mean, we, we're not such a rare breed. <laughs> it may seem like it, but once again, this is a skills matter, uh, skills matters industry. So what we're telling you is to discover what you don't know to uh, create what you haven't yet imagined. And let's get to the third and last secret. This is how to make sure your customer knows you can handle the contract. Now, once again, you know, this gets at that issue of, you know, if you're if you're a, a million dollar company trying to land a $10 million contract, all right? So there are some things you're gonna need to finesse, all right? You're gonna need to finesse the buyer's confidence. So you're gonna have to be able to show them, uh, let's just stick with the example we talked about, the, the million dollar company trying to land a $10 million contract. You're gonna have to somehow convince the buyer that, um, you know, you can handle that contract. So do you have 
uh, throughput in in your in your in your uh, factory floor to to handle the purchase, or can you identify additional people or resources to bring in? And do you have financial capacity to handle whatever might come with you know 10x in the size of your business? Are you credible? You know, can you show where you've um, uh, you know, if, if somebody comes in and do due diligence on your business, can they evidence what you have represented? You know, I, I can tell you as a buyer that it, it within about five or 10 minutes, I can determine if you're viable in what you're telling me. And if we ever got to a site visit, I will then verify if what you actually told me in all of our meetings match with what I see when I get to your office or to your uh, plant or to your business. So the question is, are you credible? Number three. I will want to know, do you have a track record with like customers? Because uh, I've got some confidence now, back to number one, that if you've done it with some other folks, you might have the ability to do it with me. But not necessarily, but I would like to know that, you, you know, how many other oil companies have you done business with? How many other automobile companies have you done with? How many more engineering firms have you done business with? I, I will want to know that because that tells me to, to what degree do you know my industry? And from that, you know, what do you know about my specific business? Then number four, am I convinced you know my business can help me? You remember we talked about that uh, continuous improvement. Now, have I heard anything uh, in your presentation that says that you will actually be able to drive value, drive improvement in my business? And then number five, do you really understand and or care about me and my company's priorities? Now, this is not a, a deal killer if you don't, because to some extent, people assume that everybody's going to be self-interested for their own businesses. I can tell you as a buyer, I was, but I can also tell you that uh, there were key relationships that I went above and beyond to protect because they were mutually beneficial. Now, what I will tell you as an XBE is if you can develop these kinds of relationships off the bat, then these are the ones that will be with you for five, 10, 15 or more years. So if you can actually demonstrate that you understand about the, co the company and you care about what's going on with the person that's sitting across the table with you uh, or sitting across the table from you or the different people that you interact with, you do it in a way with uh, integrity and authenticity. Um, you understand their priorities. They're gonna say you're on their team. And then number six, can you support their effort to drive value? Now you demonstrate these six things and they're not questioning whether or not you can handle the business. Oh, that makes absolute perfect sense, Randall. Thank you so much. And uh, you know what? That really does summarize the perspective of the Fortune 1000. And if you put yourself in their shoes and you use some of the things you just said, I could absolutely see how this is going to help. Absolutely. So with that said, uh, why don't we go to the uh, the listeners and let's let's get your questions down. If you go ahead and use that chat feature and, and type them in. And uh, while you're doing that, we're just going to start answering some questions. So uh, Adam or producer, if you could just uh, read to me uh, the first question you got up there, please. Yep, our first question um, is, I've responded to numerous RFPs, but I never win any awards. What can I do differently? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one, Rob. Excellent. So this, th this is a common issue with a number of the a number of XBEs, and actually it, it's not limited to XBEs. This is uh, a number of a number of um, suppliers in general. When I was a buyer, I would uh, oftentimes get this. And what I can tell you is there's a number of reasons that that happens. Uh, it's not just one. One of the big reasons is I may not have a lot of familiarity with your company. Um, if you are an XBE and I don't really know a lot about your company, never heard about it. If I go to your website and I can't really discover more about what you do because you have a cheesecake menu of uh, options on your website and I can't really assess uh, your ability to support what the RFP was for, um, then that's going to cause some issues. Uh, if I go and look at your Dun and Bradstreet 
and 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 not really get a lot of information that's going to cause some issues a lot of these things come up in the vetting uh to get you on the bid list in the first place but what we're finding right now is a lot of companies are taking a broad brush to getting more people in the rfp and then seeing what what's the quality of the responses so what i would tell you is you probably want to benchmark some of your competitors uh, in this case, a number of your competitors, you might be able to see some of their RFP responses on some of the public uh, websites, uh, various government entities and whatnot. You can see some of the questions that were asked and you can see the quality of the responses from your competitors. And then you have a better idea of what a quality response looks like. Uh, and then the second thing is you definitely want to take up the opportunity to do an interview with the buyer afterwards to find out why you weren't awarded the contract. Uh, see if you can't learn some information there, but I'm willing to bet you that as you look back on what we've talked about in this conversation, you, your, your unique selling proposition probably wasn't super clear. You probably weren't offering a product, you probably were offering a product and not the solution that your competitors were offering or there was something in your response that didn't give the buyer confidence that you actually could handle the contract. I can tell you from my personal experience, that's at least 75% of the reason why a number of people were bid but never received the award. You, you wanna to add to that, Rob, from your experience? No, I completely agree with you. And you know, it, it is part of that two-way communication, right? So there's nothing that says you can't go back to the organization and ask those questions and and build that customer intimacy because at the end of the day the corporate buyer is looking to uh, to ensure that you're able to meet their needs and you understand what they're looking for so you're you're absolutely right it's all about the solution it really is uh excellent answer thank you very much randall let's go uh another question please adam sure uh, the next one is companies want me to have prior experience. How do I get that experience to begin with? Ah, uh, uh, great, old, great question. Reference there. There you go. You know, we, we only want people with five years experience and uh, you can't get experience if you don't do it, but we won't hire you unless you have five years experience. I, I, I understand. And uh, that, that's a, that's a tricky question. Um, Randall, you want to uh, talk a little bit about that or would you like me to? I think we both will chime in. I'll, I'll give you my two cents worth briefly here. So I would not recommend that um, if you're just starting your business that you immediately go after the Fortune 1000. Okay, just FYI. You want to have a track record. It might make some sense to go after some government contracts, institutional contracts, other kinds of things, or you may want to go after companies smaller than uh, the Fortune 1000. You may want to go after some of the smaller contracts and actually establish that you have solid operating practices. Now, that notwithstanding, some of you came directly from corporate, you built organizations, shoot, you may have run a division, you know how to put a team together, you know how to do this, you know how you can uh, subcontract and just take over a complete operation because of all the failings that was in the operation that you had that the company just didn't pay attention to and you know you can do it better. You still have the same issue, in which case your body of experience, your network, your, ref, uh, your, your references and your resume um, may may actually do the trick, but you need to be very artful in how you tell that story to overcome this issue. Because one of the things that I can tell you firsthand is there's it's very different running a business than it was managing a process in the Fortune 1000. Because when I ran the 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 activity in the Fortune 1000. I didn't deal with everything that a business owner has to deal with, primarily buyers and, and the heightened level of customer service, which uh, can put you out of business quickly if you don't know how to handle that. And those two are your primary touch points to any customer. And as a business owner, the latitude that you had when you were internal in, in, in the business, you don't have when you are a seller. So you have to get that right. And the best way is to get it before you get to the Fortune 1000. I, I agree. And, you know, I'm just going to 
chime in uh, an addition here that you actually mentioned earlier, which is, you know, leveraging that network that you have, right? You've got a network. Uh, you may find that by working with another organization, you can go and approach uh, a single solution, but being part of that, and that then adds it to your resume that you worked on that project with that bigger name. And so you're working your way up and you're leveraging your network and you're reaching out and you're going and participating in um, in those events that the organization is present at. Right? So there are professional uh, events, there are um, diversity events, there are lots of places that um, buyers go and, and look for organizations like yourself. And when they see you there and you start to build that relationship, that's where you're going to, um, you know, to find your break. So I, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time, and it looks like we're just approaching the uh, end of the meeting here. But uh, why don't we take one more question, Adam? And if we didn't get to your question, we will answer you by email. Sure, no problem. Um, I keep putting my name in databases, but never win any opportunities. Why is that? Uh, great, great question. And once again, as Rob said, uh, for the sake of time, this is where networking helps. You want to get out and meet buyers. You want to go to networking events. You want to go to the golfing events uh, and not because you're golfing, not because that's where business is done, but because they need to see you. They need to know who you are. You need to be more than just a name in the database. And uh, if you can't be there because you're somewhat introverted, then hire a salesperson to go out and do that for you. But your company needs to be visible. Your brand needs to be visible. Somebody needs to be telling your story above and beyond what's in the database. Um, contracting with the Fortune 1000, it's as much about relationships as it is about performance. All right, you can put equal weight on both, perhaps tilt more to performance, but do not discount relationship. And relationship me doesn't mean that, um, you, you know, you can go over to somebody's head and call your buddy or your friend. Relationship is that people know who you are. You, you, you've convinced them through your consistency that uh, they can trust you with that book of business. Well, thank you so much, Randall, and uh, thank you all for your great questions. On behalf of the Diversity Consortium, just a little overview. Uh, we are 25 organizations strong. We span uh, both corporate services, um, which help businesses understand their supplier diversity strategy, help them find and outreach to organizations like yourselves, and help them bring them on board, as well as services to the XBEs themselves, part of which uh, we just talked about today. So. As you can see here in our service offerings, we've got a whole bunch of stuff on uh, both the left-hand side faced at the corporations as well as the XBEs. Um, this has also been a part of the XBE Thrive series. Um, as you'll see, we've hosted a bunch of these events. We typically hold them, give or take the same time every month. Uh, the next one's gonna be on June 30th on, at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So we look forward to you joining us there. And then we've also got these micro topics, which are a little bit deeper dive. And so we'll uh, also be posting those up on our website. So uh, please feel free to check that out. On behalf of Randall Dobbins and uh, the Diversity Consortium, I'm Rob Chavia, and I thank you for your time and your patience with us and uh, look forward to uh, speaking with you soon. Thank you again.